So I'm uh, Jerry Behrman. I'm a professor of economics and sociology at the uh, University of Pennsylvania and also active in their population studies uh, center. Uh, I've been involved in research on developing countries uh, for literally decades at this point. But in recent years, my research has focused very much on early childhood development. And I think it's sort of important to emphasize that in the context of the developing countries, uh, early childhood development has to be approached as a holistic uh, concern. Uh, sometimes in reference to the US, the emphasis on early childhood development focuses more upon uh, the topics that psychologists are interested in, such as cognitive development, social emotional development, uh, executive function, etc. Those are important for the developing world, but also very important is just physical development. So let me illustrate. Um, in the world currently, estimates are that 25% of the world's children are stunted. Stunted being very short uh, for their age in comparison with well-nourished populations. In fact, being in the jargon, uh, two standard deviations are more below the median for well-nourished populations. So why do we care? Uh, you know, for many dimensions, being short uh, isn't so bad. I happen to be a little on the tall side. Uh, but uh, unless you're going to play uh, uh, for the National Basketball Association, it may not be too bad. Well, we care because being stunted uh, early in life in particular is associated with limited neural development. And that has impacts on cognitive development, social emotional development, the other things that we do more directly care about uh, in a 21st century world. I mentioned that a quarter of the children in the world are stunted. Uh, that's about 170 million children. Um, but in certain parts of the world, the proportions are much higher. Uh, in particular, in South Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the proportions are more like 40%. That means these children uh, are, are really at risk of not uh, developing reasonably their potential. In fact, uh, the Lancet, the well-known uh, British biomedical journal, has had a series on early childhood development uh, one issue of which was just published last month. And in that issue, they uh, estimate that 250 million children worldwide are at risk of not uh, reaching their potential, primarily because of 170 million being stunted, the others uh, living in extreme uh, poverty. So from a perspective of Humanity, this is potentially just a huge loss. I mean, 250 million children. Uh, it also may be the case that this is a huge economic loss because uh, these children not being able to develop their potential uh, may have important negative implications for their productivity as adults whether in the labor force or as parents, uh, or their uh, susceptibility to various health problems. But this area has been relatively unexplored. And this is the area in which I put a lot of uh, emphasis uh, in, in the past decade and a half. Uh, in particular, uh, we've been working with an unusual data set, an unusual study, which uh, is called the INCAP. INCAP is the Institution for Nutrition in Central America and Panama, uh, Guatemalan study. In this study, uh, 
between 1969 and 1977, there were nutritional interventions in some Guatemalan villages, in some cases protein-rich uh, interventions, in some cases much less satisfactory from a nutritional point of view interventions. And we've been examining the long-run effects of those interventions 35, 40 years afterwards. And we find those effects are really large. Uh, we find that um, both men and women, 35 years later, who got the protein-enriched uh, nutrient, uh, have cognitive skills that are substantially higher by about a quarter of a standard deviation. They have reading skills, also about a quarter of a standard uh, deviation higher. The women have over a year more of schooling attainment. The men uh, earn wages which uh, are 67 cents an hour higher, which is a huge increase in a low-wage uh, country like Guatemala. The women have children who uh, are have higher birth weights by over 100 grams and are taller, have uh, better indicators in terms of these other uh, uh, anthropometric indicators of child development. So we think this is very important, not because Guatemala is the center of the world, although you know there are 20 million people, uh, roughly a little less, who live in Guatemala. Uh, but because the situation in Guatemala is all too common for an estimated 170 million children in the world. Uh, and the implications of this is that uh, the returns from investing in these children, uh, and we have available estimates the cost of investing in a wide range of developing countries where malnutrition is, is uh, substantial. The returns from investing in these children, uh, the strictly economic returns, are very high. The benefit-to-cost ratios are, are uh, by our estimates, far over one, far over ten for that matter. Now, it's not the case that the only reason you want to invest in children is because there are economic uh, returns to doing so. Uh, you may want to just because uh, of moral concerns or because of concerns about humanity. But this is a case where those concerns are reinforced uh, by the high benefit-to-cost ratios. Uh, and it also is the case that in terms of the way societies or governments uh, make decisions, um, there's a real advantage if one wants to argue for whatever reason for investing more in children to have estimates of high economic returns because the key personnel in making these decisions tend to be... Uh, in finance ministries in particular, and tend to think the way economists think about the rates of return from making alternative investments, whether it be in roads or irrigation or schools or preschools uh, or health clinics, and therefore having some evidence about the relative rate of return uh, in these uh, investments is, is uh, very useful if these uh, rates of return are as high as they appear to be. Now, in the developing world, as in uh, higher income countries, the whole story is not nutrition, it, but it's an important part of the story is what I want to emphasize. I also am engaged in studies of ways of improving parental stimulation early in life, uh, which appears on the basis of uh, a very few studies, most notably a famous study in Jamaica, uh, to have high long-run uh, uh, returns. Uh, 
And in fact, we're working with the people who created the Jamaican study, currently in a study in Odessa in India, a poor state in India, where we're doing a randomized controlled trial. Uh, and this trial involves using local women from rural villages uh, to serve as trainers either through one-on-one -on -one home visits with mothers and their children or through group sessions with groups of mothers uh, and their children, uh, as well as provide nutritional education uh, for reasons I already emphasized. Um, and uh, we hope this trial will be very useful in showing uh, whether or not our, our prior belief and our preliminary results suggest the answer is positive, whether or not this kind of intervention uh, can have substantial effects on children from very poor circumstances. Uh, this is not the poorest uh, state in India, but it's pretty poor, uh, very poor by world standards. Uh, whether by using local women, we not only get those women engaged in a broader sense in labor force-like activities, but more importantly, perhaps, uh, we improve the prospects uh, for these children. And we do it uh, by virtue of using local women at uh, a cost which makes it scalable. Anything you do in India you're starting with a population well over a billion people. You're starting with hundreds of millions of children. Uh, to make any investment uh, that's going to cover India, uh, the cost has to be reasonable. We have hopes for this, this, this program.